Welcome to uh, the Ball Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at Baylor University. Uh, my name is Peter Klein. I'm, an, I'm the academic director of the Ball Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Free Enterprise Forum featuring uh, Catherine Semser, an expert in wildlife preservation. Catherine has a lot of really interesting things uh, to tell us today. I know you're going to enjoy her talk. Uh, she's a research fellow with PERC, the Property and Environment Research Center, uh, where her work focuses on uh, how property rights and market-based solutions can be used in the context of natural resource and environmental conservation. She's going to talk specifically about wildlife uh, today. Uh, Catherine is also a research fellow with the African Wildlife Economy Institute, did I get it right, at Stellenbosch University uh, in South Africa, near Cape Town. Uh, she is the past uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Humanitarian Operations Protecting Elephants, H-O-P-E, get it, uh, which is a, an NGO that uh, focuses on um, counter-poaching programs in Africa. Uh, and she's been a leader of programs with this organization in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Ethiopia. Uh, Catherine has also been with the Sierra Club, uh, based in Washington, D.C., and with uh, McKinsey Consultants where she worked on environmental and resource issues. Um, before I turn the stage over to Catherine Semser, I want to take just a moment to tell you more about the free enterprise program at the Ball Center, in case you aren't familiar with our other activities and programs. We have a lecture series, the Free Enterprise Forum. That's the event that you're at tonight. Uh, we also have another series uh, featuring uh, local entrepreneurs called Confessions of an Entrepreneur. We've already had two meetings uh, this, uh, uh, this past fall. One was featuring um, uh, Denisha Blunt, who's the founder of Oh My Juice. Some of you might have been at that one. We also had um, Catherine Ballas, who's founder of Refit Revolution. And coming up in the early spring on February 4th, we have Austin Meek of Pokios. And some, if you come to these events, sometimes the proprietors bring free samples of their products. So you probably don't want to miss one from, from Pokios. Um, our next Free Enterprise Forum is going to be uh, November the 14th at the same time, 515, and that will feature Tim Harford, who is a best-selling author and economist. Uh, he has a column with the Financial Times in London. Uh, he also writes for Slate Magazine. Uh, he has a very, a very interesting podcast that you can listen to. Uh, he's going to be talking about his most recent uh, book called 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. So without further ado, I want to turn over the floor to Catherine Semser for tonight's Free Enterprise Forum presentation. Uh, she'll speak on Saving Africa's Wildlife, the Failure of Hunting Bands, and the Success of Entrepreneurial Solutions. So Catherine, welcome to Baylor. Thank you all for coming this evening. I appreciate the invitation to speak with all of you, and, and I'm deeply flattered that so many of you have shown up to hear what I have to say tonight. I'd like to thank Daniel Bennett for extending that invitation. I'd also like to thank Peter Klein, Kathy Carr, and the entire Baylor community for the hospitality that they've shown me today. Before we get into the discussion, that I came here to give, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about the Property and Environment Research Center. Um, Peter told you a little bit about me. My specific interests are environmental security, conservation geopolitics, and sustainability, particularly how US foreign policy affects these areas, and looking at how markets and property rights and other American values can, can further things like environmental conservation. Uh, in the interest of propriety, a little bit of disclosure. Um, we're going to be talking about hunting. And I used to hunt, but I do not hunt anymore. And I've never hunted big game in Africa or anywhere else. I'm actually a vegetarian. Um, we're also going to see some things referencing McKinsey and Company. Obviously, I used to work for them something you should all, all know. We'll also see a reference to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which I'm also a part of. 
So the Property and Environment Research Center is based in Bozeman, Montana. We're a think tank. We were founded 40 years ago, 1980, by a group of economists at Montana State University who were interested in looking at how property rights and free markets could advance the cause of environmental conservation. We're a small, lean staff. This is our core staff. But we're supported by a network of about 30 senior research fellows who are tenured professors at universities around the world. We publish PERC Reports, which is our quarterly journal. Uh, covers a wide range of topics with a global perspective, North America, Africa, Asia, South and Central America. And we also regularly host workshops uh, on and off-site from our office. Uh, upper left-hand corner is our office. Center photo is actually Ted Turner's Flying D Ranch. So sometimes we, we do get out to show how our private landowners actually impacting the conservation of wildlife. Now moving on to Africa. I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday testifying in front of the International Wildlife Conservation Council which is a federal advisory committee that is advising the Secretary of the Interior on U.S. wildlife policy as it relates to Africa. And after my testimony, a foreign service officer with the State Department said to me, it's complicated. And that's probably the understatement of the year. Africa is a very complicated place. But what I'm hoping to do this evening is provide you a 30,000 foot view of some of the issues related to wildlife conservation in Africa, particularly the issue of trophy hunting, but also looking at what's beyond trophy hunting and how can property rights, free markets, and entrepreneurship conserve the ecosystems that African economies are going to be increasingly reliant on for services in the years ahead. Africa is not a country. I think you all know that, but not everyone does. It's actually 54 countries, 54 countries, over 108 languages, and scores and scores of different tribal groups. Home to 1.2 billion people. These 1.2 billion people just formed the largest trade bloc in the world, the African continental free trade area. While much of the world is retreating from free trade, Africa is embracing it and their economies are increasingly liberalizing. And this has tremendous implications for the conservation of biodiversity. Trade block obviously represents more than 1.2 billion people, but this number is expected to double by 2050. 2.4 billion people, one trade year. And more than 50% of the people in Africa today are under the age 25. Let that sink in a little bit. They're your age. What do you see yourself doing in 2050? They see themselves making money. By 2050, it's also likely that Africa is going to represent one third of the world's population. One out of three workers will have been born in Africa. Maybe one out of three entrepreneurs in the world will have been born in Africa. Again, tremendous implications the conservation of biodiversity, particularly when we consider that six of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world are on the African continent. Now, despite this growth and despite this promise, 27% of Africans still remain food insecure according to the United, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. 589 million Africans are still without electricity 738 million still act, lack access to clean water. And this lack of sanitation is estimated to cost the continent $30 billion in economic productivity each year. There's light on the horizon, though. According to the World Bank, Africa is expected to grow on average 3.6% in the coming years. And the African continental free trade area is expected to boost trade by 52% by 2020. How is this going to happen? Through development projects, funded by China, funded by the United Nations, funded by the World Bank. I think that starts to illustrate why we're gonna see impacts on ecosystems. 
Now, it's clear that the nations of Africa will and should continue to grow their economies. The tension comes in considering to what extent healthy ecosystems will drive, be integrated, or fall victim to that growth. That's a question that African leaders are beginning to take seriously. This photo was taken this past summer at the United Nations Wildlife Economy Summit in Zimbabwe, where a commitment was made to conserve through commerce. African nations want to conserve through commerce. They want to move past the models of national parks and age. And they want that you know, commerce to go beyond tourism. They want to see their wildlife as a renewable resource that can be brought to the marketplace. So I'm going to go back. It's also evident in research that's come out of Cambridge University showing that African conservationists have an above average affinity to using capitalism to deliver conservation, significantly more than in North America and Europe. Now, this lean towards capitalism has also been evident in the past two Business of Conservation conferences held in Kigali, Rwanda. To give you a, a sense of the, the power of this conference, you can't see him very well there, but that's President Kagame of Rwanda speaking at the podium. And these conferences have seen more than half a billion dollars in venture capital raised for conservation-inclusive businesses over the last four years. Now, one of my personal heroes is a man named Fred Swanaker. Fred founded the Business of Conservation Conference. He's also a McKinsey alumni. And I think he hits the nail on the head and, and really describes how Africans are rethinking how they view the natural world. And he says, we need to challenge the idea that Africa's extraordinary biodiversity and wildlife is a diminishing resource and reframe conservation as a growth sector. We reframe conservation as a growth sector, we're more likely to mainstream it into economic development, and we're more likely to see it bear fruit. Inger Anderson, the new executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, puts a little bit of a finer point on things when she says the resources needed to make the Earth sustainable, produce renewable energy, and restore degraded ecosystems cannot come from the taxpayers alone. They have to come from leaders of the private sector. There is a growing global recognition that I don't believe has taken root yet in North America, but it's out there, that we have to move towards the private sector if we're going to protect our country. Now, tourism is still a big part of, of conservation in Africa. Most of the funding is, is still pegged to tourism, even though we're trying to to move beyond that. And I'll just give you a little bit of a snapshot of, of what we're talking about here. Tourism makes a $40 billion direct contribution to African GDP, according to the World Travel and Tourism Council. And it represents about 2.6% of continental G GDP total. That's forecast to rise to 4.8% by 2027. Tourism also provides 6% of total employment, as you can see, and about 5.6% of total investment in Africa is coming in through the tourism sector. It's about $16.9 billion. That's expected to rise by 4.9% uh, by 2027. And tourism in Africa globally ranks fourth in terms of both growth and total growth. And the Three markets that are primarily driving this are the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. Now, most people go to Africa to see the wildlife, and I know that's what you all came here tonight to hear about. In terms of volume of participation, wildlife watching is the most popular wildlife-related activity, according to the UN World Tourism Organization most popular wildlife-related activity in Africa, anyway. We've got about $142 million in revenue collected by African states through entrance fees to national parks. The bird watching industry in South Africa alone is worth $26 million. And gorilla viewing in, in Uganda, I'm sorry, uh, brings in about $15 million to the country. 
Now, by comparison, trophy hunting in sub-Saharan Africa is valued at $426 million. Put this in context, trophy hunting's contribution in the analyzed countries is three times the amount collected in entrance fees for national parks. Now, what's the common denominator for wildlife conservation in Africa? Habitat. Wildlife doesn't care if it lives in a national park or not. Wildlife cares about the quality of the land that it lives on. Does it have cover? Does it have food? And, excuse me, more than 166 million acres of public and private lands in sub-Saharan Africa is currently conserved as hunting areas. That's roughly four times the size of the national park system in the region. It's roughly twice the size of the U.S. national. Most of these areas are not suitable for photo tourism. You know, in this debate around trophy hunting, you often hear, well, why can't they just switch to photo tourism? And if you look at Africa's national parks, they tend to be located near population centers, places that tourists can fly into. They tend to have very well constructed infrastructure, paved roads, whatnot. They tend to have hotels, they tend to have access to electricity. Hunting areas don't have any of this. These areas are remote, they're rugged, they're often dangerous, and they're not the places where you know, people tend to want to be fishing for that reason. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they're also, even though they're not great for tourism, they're still ecologically important. And if we didn't have these areas, we would be losing species that aren't big game, but are the, the little things that run the world, the biodiversity, if you will. Hunting ranches in South Africa have played a critical role in recovering the waterbird blue butterfly, an incredibly rare species. In Katata 11, which we're going to see a little video on in a second, they found endemic species of rats, which might not sound that important, but we don't know what those rats could be useful for at some point in the future. Every species matters. Now, Katata 11 is a trophy hunting concession in Mozambique. And it's an example of how entrepreneurship and ecosystem recovery can start to come together. The hero of this video is a gentleman named Mark Haldane. And by way of disclosure, Mark is a close personal friend of mine. We actually met in my former occupation, the first client that the counter poaching organization I worked for had was Mark and his anti-poaching unit. And uh, we've known each other for years as that relationship developed. I think he's one of the greatest unsung heroes of conservation in Africa or anywhere else. And I hope that we tell his story well in this video um, because it really does show how entrepreneurship and conservation Now, one thing that's not discussed in that video is Mark has been so successful in restoring the plains game in his concession. And I should note that this concession is about the size of Yellowstone National Park. That he has had to reintroduce lions into the concession. Those lions you saw were reintroduced by Mark because the volume of hunters is not enough to control the population of animals. So he's bringing back the large carnivores to stop the buffalo and other species from literally eating themselves out of house and home. These lions will never be hunted in that concession. They exist purely to feed on the game that he's restored and help him keep those numbers in check. And there's scores of people like Mark across sub-Saharan Africa that are leveraging trophy hunting and, and the market that's created by trophy hunting to deliver conservation like this. But there's also a growing political movement in the West that would like to stop people like Mark from doing what he's doing. And I think we you know, need to think about like what would their success be? Because there's a good chance that they will be successful given the way that the politics is going. I don't believe that it would mean anything good. And we have evidence from across Sub-Saharan Africa to suggest that. There was a 2016 peer-reviewed study from the World Wildlife Fund which found that if hunting were eliminated in the conservancies in Namibia, 84% of those wildlife conservancies would no longer be economically viable. That includes the conservancies where there is some phototourism taking place. 
That's not completely surprising when we consider that other research shows that hunting contributes $19.6 million to the Namibian economy. It's nearly a third more than guerrilla viewing contributes to Uganda's economy. And these revenues benefit almost 65% of the rural communities in Namibia. If the people don't economically benefit from conservation, like Mark was talking about, that habitat will be converted into agriculture. And what we would see in Namibia, where hunting to disappear, would be more than 12 million acres of wildlife habitat, roughly five times the size of Yosemite National Park, being converted to agriculture as quickly as possible. So photo tourism is not an easy replacement in Namibia or anywhere else for trophy hunting. In fact, in Botswana, research has shown that only about a third of the country's conservation areas are economically viable as photo tourism. And again, this is because they're remote, they're undeveloped, they're dangerous, they're rugged. They're not the places where people are going to go on vacation. Now, some policymakers have tried to split the baby. And they're saying that, OK, it's OK to hunt plains game, hunt the, hunt the Cape buffalo, hunt the eland, hunt the springbok. But other species, like elephants and lions, should be off limits. But what the existing research indicates is that that's not a solution, because those are the high value species. Those are the ones that bring in the most money to operations like Mark Haldane's. And there was analysis conducted by researchers at the University of Pretoria, which determined that if just lion hunting were to end in Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia, almost 15 million acres of conservation areas would suffer a decreased economic viability as conservation areas. And we would likely see the same type of situation play out as we would see in Namibia. Those areas would be converted to agriculture quite quickly. In fact, we're already seeing that in Tanzania um, because of US policies limiting the import ports of uh, hunting trophies from Tanzania. <laughs> those hunting blocks are being abandoned. And they're quickly being taken over by cattle. The lions are being scared by horrible, horrible deaths of suffocation and infection. And they're going to be cattle pasture probably within the next few years. And there's not really anything that this point that we can stop it, even if we were to reverse the US policy. And not only would the bans on hunting lead to ecosystem degradation, they may also undermine national and regional food security. There's this perception out there that trophy hunting means that a rich American or a rich European goes to, to Africa, goes into the bush, kills an animal, cuts its head off, flies home, and sticks it on its wall. That's not what happens at all. I know this is something that a lot of Americans have trouble getting their heads around, maybe. But if you travel to Africa, you can eat giraffe. You can eat elephant. You can eat lion. You can eat a whole host of animals that are pretty much the traditional foods of these regions, just like venison is a traditional food for us. And what happens in the trophy hunting situation is, yes, you know, the American or the European might kill the animal. But that meat goes on to feed the people in the area. The way these systems are often set up in places like Zimbabwe um, and, and elsewhere is the government tells a rural village, OK, you can kill three elephants a year for, for your own food store. What they'll then do is take those permits and sell them to the Americans and the Europeans, bring in six or more figures of cash income, and keep the meat as well. So it's a value-added proposition when this happens. We know that in Tanzania, um, I'm sorry, in, in Zambia, uh, trophy hunting is responsible for delivering almost 130,000 kilograms of fresh game to rural villages each year. And that's not an insignificant amount of nutrition for people who are facing food insecurity. If we ban trophy hunting, we're literally taking food out of people's mouths. And that's something that I think our policymakers need to consider. But I don't want to leave you with the idea that trophy hunting, photo tourism, or, or any kind of tourism is some kind of cure-all for securing the ecosystems that Africa depends on for its long-term prosperity. It's not. It's not, and that's why 
forums like the Business of Conservation Conference give me a lot of hope and, and really inspire me. Tourism is part of the solution, but it, it's not the solution itself. If we're gonna be successful at maintaining options for development, and by development I mean sustainable development, we need more entrepreneurial solutions in the conservation sphere. We need more private investors, and we need, need more mainstreaming of conservation into the political decision-making process. So the Business of Conservation Conference has raised a half a billion dollars. That's impressive. That, that's close to real money, right? But the reality is that's just a drop in the bucket. There was a study that was done by Credit Suisse in conjunction with the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and McKinsey and Company. And what this study found was that sitting on the sidelines right now is about $400 billion in potential investment for conservation projects. This is impact investment. And this is impact investment that's conservation specific. The reason this capital is not flowing and not being applied is a lack of investable projects. We're still stuck in this mindset that conservation means designating a national park. What we need to start doing and what our policymakers need to start encouraging is saying conservation is about starting a business. And there's people who are starting to, to latch on to this. The gentleman um, who's in the upper left-hand corner is a man named Paul, T Paul Tudor Jones. Does anyone know who Paul Tudor Jones is? So Paul Tudor Jones is the chairman of Tudor Capital Group, one of the first hedge funds to ever come into existence. He's a billionaire. And he's betting on Africa. He's building conservation-supportive businesses in South Africa, in Tanzania, and now he's trying to expand into Zambia. And what he's doing is he's creating game ranches. These are ranches similar to the ones that you have in Texas. He's raising wildlife to provide food for people because the wildlife has a lower carbon footprint than cattle does in terms of its production. He sees it as a food source for the future. And I think he's right. Uh, he's meeting here with the president of Zambia to discuss his plans. And until that market you know, gets to scale, he's also making some money off of tourism. He's putting billions of dollars into the conservation systems, and he's making a profit on it. We're also seeing NGOs get into the game. Um, the African Wildlife Foundation, which was one of the first African conservation organizations, has started a $5 million venture capital fund. Not a lot of money, but still not insignificant. And they're investing in conservation supportive businesses in Africa, like the Rwanda Avocado Company in Tanzania. And what this is, is they're keeping open an agricultural corridor between protected areas. It's not a wild land, but it's land that wildlife can use and that would otherwise be developed where this uh, agricultural commodity not being produced on this land. Similarly, Conservation International, one of the big heavy hitters in the conservation sphere started a $200 million venture capital fund. In one place, they're placing a bet as a company called Kamza in Kenya. And what Kamza does, sorry, is help small-scale farmers start tree farms and, and bring those trees to market. And the reason that they're doing this is because the hope is that by, well, let me take a step back. Kenya is very quickly going to be a middle-income country, and they have a huge demand for and one of the questions is, how do we keep from logging Kenya's native forests, which have high rates of species endemism, and produce wood in a sustainable way? So Conservation International, working with Kamza, is working with small landowners to start tree farms to meet the country's wood needs, to meet their fiber needs, so that we don't have to log those native forests. But there's obstacles to this conservation investment. And this is where policymakers the biggest obstacle to impact investment in Africa is a lack of secure property. <clears throat> Not everyone has the ability to take risks like Paul Tudor Jones does. People are very reluctant to invest in businesses 
when there's no secure property right because next week somebody might show up to that farm and say this is mine now. and it's as simple as that and if you don't get off I'm going to shoot you there was an investor survey done by the US Agency for International Development that found out that this was the case I have it cited here so I don't have to write it down it's a really interesting on these obstacles to international cooperation. But to their credit, USAID is acting to overcome this. Uh, we have an app deployed, and when I say we, I mean the United States, called the Mobile Application to Secure Tenure. And what this does is allow people in Africa to map out their land and resource rights using their mobile phone. And then those rights are verified and put into the blockchain so that they can't be compromised. A government official can come along and say, this is my because it's actually in there in the record, and it's unalterable. Another place where I think the US is playing a positive role is in Kenya. Kenya doesn't have hunting. Kenya has seen precipitous declines of its wildlife, up to 89% of some species outside of its national parks. And this traces back to wildlife not having value for local people, and it not having value because they don't hold rights in the wildlife or the land where the wildlife is found. But that's changing with the Kenyan Conservancy Movement. The Kenyan Conservancy Movement is a grassroots political movement in Kenya to start giving rural people property rights over the land that they live on. And they're also advocating for giving themselves some degree of rights over the wildlife that lives on that land so that they can use it to either feed themselves, which is also currently or more likely begin game ranches, which have been as you know, successful in other countries. There's still a lot of kinks to work out with this movement. Kenya has a very entrenched bureaucracy that is reluctant to give up power. But the movement does have the support of the US government, both financial and technical. And I'm optimistic that we're going to see some good things happen in Kenya in the next couple of years. I'll just close by reiterating more than 50% of the population of under the age of 25. And when we talk about banning trophy hunting, when we talk about having conservation be a command and control exercise as opposed to an entrepreneurial exercise, you know, I say to our leaders, what message are we sending to these people? Because you know, I think what we're telling them is, you can't be trusted to manage your own resources. I think we're telling them you can't be trusted I also think we're basically telling them capitalism's not for you. <coughs> I don't think that's a really productive approach for us or for the people who live in that country. So with that, I'll close this 30,000 foot view of conservation in Africa and I welcome your questions. Oh, yeah, so we have a mic uh, so everybody can hear your question, but we have time for questions for Catherine. Yeah. Uh, how big of a factor is corruption in the government and uh, civil unrest in basically a government and federal instability in Africa and in getting investments? Um, well, it depends on who you talk to. Yeah, there, there's definitely people who are profiting off of that type of environment. Um, I think about the Central African Republic where you know, various Russian mercenary companies are making a killing, no pun intended, uh, off of that kind of environment. Um, to other kinds of, of investors, it, it can be a significant obstacle. Corruption is something that exists everywhere. It's not an obstacle just to invest in Africa, it's an obstacle to investment across the world. In terms of civil unrest, I think it's important to note that Africa is more at peace today than it has been at almost any point since 1960. The continent is becoming much less violent. At the same time, the violence that does exist is becoming much more intense. And there's a lot of concern in security circles that climate change, unless 
some type of adaptation comes um, up to scale quite quickly. Um, violence could intensify. You know, we're already seeing places like the Lake Chad Basin in Cameroon um, become hotbeds of, of extremist activity because of natural resource degradation, uh, which people are tying back to climate change. Yes? Yeah, are there opportunities to invest for like, people like us or anything like that? Are there opportunities to invest for people like you or that? <laughs> There definitely are. Um, you know, probably the easiest way to, for anyone to invest is, is to put your money into a fund of some kind. And there are Africa-specific funds that are out there, some of which are also focused on ESG um, governance. And I can you know, get your contact information and send you some information on those afterwards. A really good question. Could you repeat the question? Yes. So the question was what percentage of the people hunting are tourists from Europe or the United States and what percentage are local people? And that really depends um, on the exact area. In South Africa, you basically have a split system. There's two kinds of hunting. Um, there's the trophy hunting, which is primarily done by tourists. And trophy hunting is where you're looking for that big animal you know, so that you can put that back on your wall. Um, but South Africa also has a second kind of hunting called biltong hunting. And biltong is the Afrikaans word uh, for bull's tongue, basically. And what, what it means um, is jerky, essentially, it's dried meat. And there is a huge biltong hunting um, industry that occurs in these uh, game ranches as well with local people hunting. South Africa is able to do this more easily than other countries because they have a private property right in wildlife. They've just got a lot more wildlife. You know, there's a lot more incentive to have large herds of animals on your land. Um, South Africa you know, gave a private property right in wildlife somewhere around 1980-something. I forget the exact year. Um, but immediately we saw 50 million acres of, of cattle ranches converted into wildlife conservation areas. And you know, the, the amount of biomass that's present on these places is, is absolutely astounding. And uh, it allows for this dual system. You know, they can just take more animals out. They also have to call, it, call animals you know, to maintain herd health. Yes? So what can we as a college students do to take part in this? Are there other kids internship recommendations or organizations in general or what? Come do a, a fellowship at Perk. We're researching this. Um, this is a, a big passion of ours, and uh, you know we need, we need all the help we can get um, to do that research. I can give you more information. Um, I've actually grown up in Africa for most of my life, in Namibia specifically, and so I agree with everything you've said, and I really appreciate someone um, on your platform using it to uh, educate people on proper conservation practices, because I'm really um, involved in that, but I did have one question related to um, to corruption uh, in a country like Tanzania, where a lot of the poaching, especially elephant poaching, that happens on abandoned hunting blocks, actually is government mandated, um, you know, behind the scenes, and where next year spe specifically they're raising the tender prices for hunting blocks, where they're pushing most or a lot of outfitters out because they just simply can't afford to pay that amount of price for those government blocks. Um, do you have a, a proposal for a solution to tackle the, that government corruption? No. <laughs> no corruption is, is, is one of those issues that's way above my pay grade, unfortunately. Um, it's something I have to contend with. I'm unfortunately not in a position to, to address it. You know, it is a challenge, and I, I think, you know, I think one of the reasons it is so pervasive in Tanzania, you know, they have a very, they, they have a, a government with a very strong Marxist-Leninist history, and, and I think that that has fed the you know, corruption that we see in that country. But it's absolutely devastating. I mean, you know, because of the combination of the way the government has managed things, and also the U.S. you know policy banning the import of trophies from Tanzania, 
There was one family that gave up six million acres of hunting bull. Six million acres. That's about two and a half Yellowstone National Park. Tremendous area of land. And being converted now to cattle pasture. And the lions are being snared, the elephants are being poached. That's the consequence. Uh, what's the biggest misconception that most people have about Africa? That it is, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. I want to quote our president. These, these are not um, dirty, poor, destitute, unsavory countries, as some people say. So the images that we see of Africa on television feed what I call the poverty industry. I mean, yes, there's poor people there. There is poverty. But there's also modern cities. There's also highly educated people. There's also entrepreneurs. And that's only going to continue to, to, to you know, be the case. Africa is going to leapfrog all of us, you know, is, is the reality. They're, they're going from you know, the mid-20th century to the 20, 22nd very quickly. Do you think we could use this idea of capitalism for um, conservation in other areas, such as overfishing in the oceans? Absolutely. I mean, one area that PERC has pioneered is uh, what's called ITQs, um, individual transferable quotas for fisheries, where you're basically giving the commercial fishermen a property right in, in a certain amount of fish. And it can be traded on a market, you know, so if somebody wants to you know, get out of the fishing business, they can sell that ITQ to somebody who wants to stay in the business and that person can increase their catch. It's met with mixed success. You know, it's, it's a fairly new program. It's been adopted by the United States. It's also been adopted by South Africa. I think it deserves some exploration because we do have severe um, conflicts emerging over fisheries in Africa, particularly in Lake Victoria and off the coast of Ghana. They're being driven by slightly different circumstances, but I think Having something like ITQs and having rights that can be enforced in a court of law could go a long way to preventing the conflict that we currently have from becoming a shooting. Okay, Catherine, could you talk a little bit more about other ways in which technology interacts with sort of institutions and property rights? So you mentioned like with the fishing quotas to the extent that rights maybe to land or to um, particular activities, hunting or fishing, you know, for, for them to be tradable, they have to be, it has to be possible to sort of define and enforce them well. And sometimes it's difficult to do that for, for animals, for example. Could you talk a little, or for land claims, could you talk about how technology, technological advancement in general is assisting with the kinds of uh, approaches you're talking about? I think the blockchain in particular, is going to be revolutionary in Africa as well as around the rest of the world. We're already seeing a number of African governments adopt the blockchain as the primary record keeping system, which is why the United States has the MASS program in place that I discussed earlier. You know, another place where the blockchain can come into play with regard to you know, free market approaches, at least, South Africa legalized the domestic trade in rhino horn. Now, rhino horn is a renewable resource remove the horn from a rhinoceros without harming the animal and it will grow back. There's a huge stockpile of rhino horn in South Africa right now and they want to sell it to raise money for conservation and for, for other purposes. And when South Africa legalized their domestic trade, a lot of activists went bonkers. It was absolutely apoplectic at the idea that all of a sudden we're going to be trading in rhino horn. And their concern, you know, was not completely illegitimate. There is a black market for rhino horn that stems from the presence of the international bank on trade. And the concern was that any kind of legal market would become a, uh, a, um, a fence of sorts, you know, for, for the black market. But I think you can solve that, and, I, and I've written on this. You know, every single horn that has been acquired legally in South Africa and put in, in the stockpile has been uh, DNA indexed and put into a database. 
Now what you can do is each one of those indexes can become a block on a blockchain. So you can increase the transparency of the rhino horn trade by having the DNA indexing married with the blockchain because you'll know that any horn that you see in the marketplace that isn't in the chain was acquired illegally. And then you, that will help law enforcement too because they, they won't be chasing every single horn that's out there, just the ones that are illegal. So just to like clear this up, ultimately you believe that more private property on Africa that is for big game hunting would be beneficial to Africa, ultimately? You know, I, I wouldn't go that far. Um, something I didn't talk about earlier, but your question raises. I don't think the trophy hunting industry is, is viable in the long run. And I think that that's primarily due, due to what's happening in the United States. We represent 70% of the global trophy hunting market. And the hunting population in this country, maybe not in Texas, but in the rest of this country, is starting to age out. And what you're seeing is that the people who used to be interested in um, going to hunt in Africa, and more importantly, who could afford to hunt in Africa, they're getting older. And they don't want to take a 24 to 33 hour flight Last year, there was a 60% decline in hunting bookings in South Africa. What industry can survive that over the course of a couple of years? Now, South Africa's buffered a little bit because you do have the, you know, the meat industry that's related to, to the hunting trade. So the landowners are still making some money um, off of the meat. But uh, yeah, this is why I say you know we have to look beyond hunting and we have to look beyond photo tourism and diversify the approaches that we're applying to, to conservation in Africa. We need to be investing more in sustainable agriculture, sustainable timber, and finding other ways to, to financially support conservation that aren't reliant on either hunting or photo tourism. But hunting especially because that, that industry is, is just on a downward trajectory. So what you're saying is that like you ultimately believe that big game hunting is very beneficial to the ecosystem in Africa, which keeps like the numbers obviously from like 1980 to 2019 with lions and elephants and stuff like that. You're worried that since there's a huge decline in big game hunters that Africa is going to have to focus on something different to like have their economy going, which will... To conserve the ecosystem services that'll keep their economy going. You know, with trophy hunting, the way I sort of look at it is it's been incredibly beneficial at restoring wildlife populations during the local war. You know, this gentleman from Namibia, I mean, Namibia is completely inspiring. I mean, Namibia was embroiled in a long-term war. They call it the last hot battle of the Cold War um, for decades. And Namibia only became its own country in 1990. And in the space of time between 1990 and today, we've seen a tremendous regrowth of wildlife populations largely because of trophy hunting and the economic incentives it provides. Now that said, it's been successful at restoring wildlife populations. It's been successful at maintaining those wildlife populations. At this point, though, I think you know, what trophy hunting is doing is it's buying us time. We don't want to take it off the table, um, you know, particularly when it's, it's going to go its own way. But it buys us time to figure out what comes next. You know, and until we figure out what comes next, we certainly shouldn't be entertaining banning the practice. Does that make sense? We still have time for a couple more. I think it could have an impact, you know, particularly on the South African market. I mentioned, you know, they've got the herd densities that can accommodate the built hunting. And, you know, the South Africans take that meat home, obviously. It's a lot less expensive than trophy hunting um, to, part you know, to part participate in. Um, I think it could boost the industry if, you know, yourself or someone else could go to South Africa 
kill an eland or a springbok or anything else, and take the meat home with them, just like you would from New Zealand or Montana or Colorado. But you know, USDA, for I don't think very good reasons, seems reluctant to do that right now. And you know, when I'm in DC, those are the types of policies I'm looking at. Um, the biggest policy change I would make is that I would have all of our grant programs through USAID and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have a stated policy preference for supporting market-based approaches. Okay. Um, Jeff, you have They tend to be unrelated. You know, if you look at the the data that's out there, you don't see a lot of poaching in hunted areas. Um, where you do see the most poaching uh, is in the national parks. And if you think about it, you know, the national parks are sort of, you know, if it's owned by everyone, it's owned by no one. And in particularly in countries like Kenya, there's been a lot of um, issues with the, the revenues from the parks being shared with the local communities, and there's a lot of hostility. Um, of those gateway communities towards the national parks, and you, you're basically breeding poachers. Hunting areas, not so much. Do you think the industrialization of Africa, the growth of urban areas, maybe increases in agricultural productivity? Will any of these threaten the viability of wildlife conservation programs? They will, and that's sort of why I, I stress this idea of mainstreaming conservation into decision making. And the World Bank has warned a number of sub-Saharan African governments that they need to make ecosystem conservation a priority because those ecosystems are going to provide the services that economic growth depends on. How well they're heeding that advice, I don't know. I mean, I look at a country like Kenya. Um, they're building massive infrastructure projects in their national parks. They're cutting off migration routes for wildlife. There's 100 migrations right now in Kenya that are in danger of collapsing um, due to a combination of infrastructure development and, and agricultural expansion. That's, that's not good for a country that you know, has pegged its entire conservation program um, on tourism because it's going to very quickly become um, the case where there's, there's no wildlife to see in these national parks. It's, it's directly related and, and something that uh, needs to be paid much more attention to. We're going to give this gentleman the last, you got the first question and you're going to get the last one. Perfect. Um, I know you talked about uh, creating tree farms and like kind of creating ways in order for the people to use their natural resources. Uh, how, do, how do mining operations in that industry come into play with like conservation in Africa? It's a really good question. Um, I have not seen the mining industry play a positive role. That does not mean that it can't play a positive role. There's a huge problem, particularly in Central Africa, of what they call our artisanal mining, which is small-scale mining. Um, this mining is not regulated, and so there's a lot of water pollution that comes along with it. There's also um, you know, a fair amount of land clearing that comes along with it. How to involve the mining sector in a way, you know, uh, kind of involve the mining sector in conservation in a way that goes beyond funding. I'm not sure of the answer to that question. But they're actually, they're absolutely a critical player. Um, you yeah, know, there, there's Chinese mining companies right now in Central Africa who are clearing huge swaths of forests to, to uh, build legal mines. And, you know, it would be great if, you know, they could be taking a more sensitive approach doing that. Um, there's a lot of rare earth minerals located underneath conservation areas. And, and that's going to be a, a growing issue for, for these countries is do we mine for the rare earth minerals and get the money from the, you know, the export market for that, or do we maintain you know, our conservation areas? Um, one positive is, is De Beers, the, the diamond company, who has massive diamond mines in Botswana and elsewhere. Beers has been playing a positive role as a funder 
And what they've been doing is underwriting the translocation of excess animals um, from hunting areas to Mozambique National Park, um, where the wildlife, as the video described, has pretty much been shot out. Great. Well, Catherine, thanks again very much for coming here and taking your time.